Namaste, Dave. Namaste, Bhagavan. <laughs> okay, trying to keep it all together here. You had yeah. some ideas for uh, topics or questions? Yeah, so uh, I first wanted to touch on the things that we kind of lost from the last conversation because I thought that they were pretty interesting. So oh. the first the first topic was um, how does recursion in like our universe show that it's intelligent? Or does recursion need intelligence? As far as I can tell, it recursion in and of itself doesn't need intelligence. I mean, it, the intelligence of a very low kind, a mechanical kind, is sufficient. For example, yesterday, I think we made the example of a fractal. Everybody's seen the Mandelbrot set and the Julia set and so on. Fractals. And a fractal is simply a bunch of points that are calculated by a very short formula. But you take the output of the formula and feed it back into the input. And then it calculates the next point. And you do that a few million times and you get some very intricate designs in which the overall form is repeated and reflected in the details of the form. And the more you zoom in, the more you find all kinds of variations on the original form. We see this in nature. For example, in the leaves of trees or in snowflakes. That there is a basic design, like in the case of snowflakes, six-sided design. And that's just repeated. The same motif is repeated with variations over and over again. So in the beginning of the universe, this is where it gets interesting. <laughs> Shiva and Shakti become the first couple, the primordial couple, male and female principles. And then they expand themselves into triples. A triple is a subject, an object, and a relationship. And so we see this same pattern, this triple pattern repeated over and over and over in the universe. For example, in the three gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, or Rudra, or in the three modes of material nature, the gunas, goodness, passion, and ignorance. And indeed, the, the um, Brahma, the creator, exemplifies the mode of passion, because that's what passion does. It creates stuff. And Vishnu, the mode of goodness, because he maintains everything, and he, he guards and protects the universe. And then finally, Rudra, typifies the mode of ignorance because he destroys everything. Time destroys everything. So this pattern of uh, a polarity and a relationship between the, the poles of the polarity is repeated innumerable times at all scales in the universe. And it's one of the things that enables the universe to propagate itself without a further creative effort. Once the thing is set up, as long as it, it's protected, you know, and maintained by Vishnu, it just goes. So, and that being said, like, we can see that with the form, uh, the formation of new molecules, new chemicals, uh, everything is constantly changing. Is is that an indication that consciousness is in the level of atoms, like atoms have consciousness? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's responsible for, for example, uh, when an electron changes its energy level or a photon? You know, what, what kind of logic or what kind of intelligence or consciousness is responsible? It's a very low level, but it's there. There's no way to predict 
what an individual atom or electron or photon is going to do. The famous two slit experiment, which is a very easy physics experiment anybody can do on a tabletop, shows that each individual photon has to pass through one of two slits in a diffraction grating. It can only pass through one. Which one is it going to go through? Well, there's no way to tell. As far as each individual photon is concerned, only statistically over a large number of photons is it possible to make any kind of a, you know mathematical guess. So are the, are the patterns that we see, because that makes me think of the observer effect, are the patterns that we see in this like phenomena that is like our existence in the waking state, is that just due to our interface, like how the human is interacting with this phenomena? Absolutely. How you look determines what you see. And we've all had experiences of this, you know, um, when you're in a, an optimistic mood, you know, and uh, you're feeling good and everything is going great, right? It continues to go great. Or at least you interpret it that way. But if you're in a, a down mood and you're pessimistic and you're bah humbug, you know, <laughs> things tend to stay that way. People around you pick up on it and they respond in an appropriate way and so on like that. So yeah, there's a lot to this it ties into um, things like positive thinking. You know, uh, if you look at the world from the point of view of consciousness, you can't help but think in a positive way because consciousness is so fundamental and indestructible. Nothing can harm it, nothing can change it. Uh, or I should say unconditioned awareness yeah. Because consciousness certainly can change and is definitely influenced by its contents, by its objects. Mm -hmm. So the consciousness or the unconditioned awareness is so robust, anti-fragile even, because it is fundamental, it is absolute, it is Brahman. And Brahman, that same Brahman, which is the same in all living creatures, is simply reflected in their bodies and minds, sense organs, and so forth. And that gives rise to the illusion that there's consciousness everywhere. See, actually, there is consciousness everywhere in the sense that everything is only Brahman. Brahman is all that is. And the world that we see is simply an illusion formed by these fractal uh, recombinations of the three modes. Uh, based in awareness, because everything needs awareness in order to interact with each other. Yeah, it has to all the way down to atoms and subatomic particles. But in the higher animals, we see all the symptoms of the four stages of consciousness. Isn't it? Even though they may not be able to talk yeah. about it. Yeah, like dogs and cats, they dream, they have memory, they have association. Yes. Their consciousness changes over time. Yes, they adapt to different circumstances. Uh, they show intelligence and initiative and drive. So uh, all these four states of consciousness are there in everything. And they manifest to the degree that the vehicle or the uh, thing that's reflecting consciousness, uh, how sophisticated it is. And in the human form, of course, this reaches the pinnacle. But that doesn't mean there isn't consciousness elsewhere. There is, it's everywhere. This was the experience I had back in 1984. 
almost exactly uh, just a few days ago was 38 years. <laughs> mm. 38. That number keeps coming up, you know. Uh, I grew up in a house, number 238. And when I just woke up from the nap, it was 538. <laughs> I mean, this happens. <laughs> Really, it happens numerous times a day to me. I don't know what it's all about. But anyway, when uh, our consciousness is reflected back on itself, in other words, it's like taking a, a mirror, if, it's, if this is possible, taking a mirror and using it to reflect itself. And of course, if you get two mirrors and you put them in front, one in front of the other, you get like an infinite regress, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So in the same way, when the uh, consciousness is directed towards itself and reflects itself, you get to realize Brahman. Wow, that, that's actually a really good connection between the two, like... Uh just seeing how two mirrors will just cause this infinite panel. And if you look in it, it it'll go in every direction. Yes. That's, uh, right. Yeah, that's like the infinite space of awareness, basically. Yeah, if you, I've seen experiments where they made a cubicle, like an eight-sided cubicle that was all mirrors. <laughs> mm. And then they put some animal like a dog inside, and of course it freaks out. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. Where are all those dogs coming from? Ah! <laughs> That's uh, borderline torture. That's horrible. <laughs> um, two topics that you touched on that I actually was going to get into, um, and, I, and I'll let you take the lead. One was um, we talked about emotions. So how much one of the questions was how much can we rely on our on our emotions since noli is trying to teach unconditional happiness and usually people um misinterpret happiness or maybe they misassociate it with things um how much of our emotions can we actually rely on and the other question was on shamanism but i guess we could start with uh, we can we can get to that later one question at a time <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. There's a, a definite correlation between emotion and spiritual life. And again, it has to do with the gunas, the three modes of, ma of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. Goodness means or refers to actions and modes and energies and whatnot, anything that tends toward enlightenment. And so the kind of, of uh, emotions that are appropriate in the mode of goodness are like love, compassion, beauty, you know, appreciation, thankfulness, joy, you know. And uh, in the mode of passion, you have emotions like lust, extraordinary mm -hmm. desire, um, agitation, you know, the need to move, the ur urge to move, the kinetic uh, energy kind of thing. Um, the urge to possess and enjoy and be the owner of things, to have honor and prestige and a, a noted title, elevation in society like that. And in the mode of ignorance, one uh, is depressed oppressed, feels uh, hopeless, just wants to like blot out everything, go away from everything, uh, disengage. And um, it's, it's, oh yeah, the urge toward intoxication, towards actually uh, sleep and unconsciousness. So, yeah, the modes are what determine our emotions, which mode we're following. That's why spiritual life, I think we got into this yesterday too, but it didn't get recorded. Spiritual life means cultivation of the mode of goodness. That's why we do things like get up early in the morning, 
chant mantras, do puja, where we cultivate love of God. We, you know, appreciate the beauty of the creation. We try to understand how, you know, the intelligence of the creator is manifested in the amazing life forms that we see and so on and so on and so on. Uh, this is cultivation of spiritual life, meditation, contemplation of consciousness. You know, this is exactly what we're dealing with in Noli. Mm -hmm. That's why it leads to happiness because we're cultivating the mode of goodness. And uh, the mode of goodness could also be translated as like the sustaining mode. The which? The sustaining mode, the mode of uh, sustain, like uh, stableness, maintaining. Yeah, maintenance, right. Sus sustenance. Yeah. Vishnu. yeah, sustenance. Yeah. Because Vishnu, uh, even though he is God, you know, the supreme intelligence, he has to believe in the existence of the material world because he has to maintain it. He has to protect it. He is like the original guru who teaches all the different arts that sustain, maintain the world. You know, so uh, he, he is in illusion in a sense. So is Lord Brahma because he has to create the universe. You have to believe in the universe to create it. Huh? Mm. If I'm writing a piece of music and I don't believe that I can write music, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> but if I believe, oh yeah, this music is real, it's good, it's gonna have a good effect on people. You know, this is a good thing that I'm doing. Then I can do it, I can create. So in so the same way, it Huh? Is that pantheon like uh, the function, the, the pantheon of like Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva or Rudra is like uh, the functions of consciousness? Exactly. If, but in the, in the universal, in a universal sense. Yeah, yeah. That's the, the universal or cosmic scale. The mm. same thing is going on in the individual human. We call that the... Um, what is that called? <laughs> Law the Grunties? Huh? Is it the Grunties? No, no. It's the um, as above, so below. The Hermetic Law. Hermetic, oh, Hermetic Law, yeah. Yeah. As above, so below. In other words, the actions of the gods and the roles they play and their activities you know, all these stories that we read in the scriptures and so on are like prototypes of our human world. And they, uh, the, the value of these stories, you know, is that they uh, typify the experiences that we actually have in life, just on a big scale. Mm -hmm. But the same principles are going on. We can learn a lot from them. That actually really ties into um, what I was going to ask about the I Ching and shamanism, oh. um, the, intera <laughs> the interaction between a person who um, comes to the, re the realization that this whole entire experience is intelligent and what is the use um, and what is the explanation to, to this process? Because there's a whole bunch of different religions that have this form of communication with like the universe tarot cards is really popular right now. Yeah. And I think it's like one of the forms. Let me get out my Ouija board and I'll give you the answer. Here. <laughs> <laughs> it's called an oracle. An, an oracle, you know, like prayer is when you speak to God. But an oracle is when you let God speak to you. Mm. And... I Ching is a good one. Taro, you mentioned, and so on. There's so many. Jyotish, you know, so many. And basically, uh, what you're doing is you're opening up a communication channel that has a lot of nuance to it. You know, it's a high bandwidth channel. And you're asking a question. You're putting an intention out there. 
saying, what about this? And then you're listening, you're all ears. Like, you know, what does the universe have to say about this? And you notice in each one of these oracles, there's some random operation, some random principle. Mm -hmm. Like in the I Ching, you're throwing coins or picking yarrow stalks or whatever the method you used. And uh, even in astrology, there's a method, uh, what is it called? Um, I forget the name just now, but it's when you ask a question and you throw a chart for the time of the question, time and place of the question. And that gives you the answer. Mm -hmm. See, our tarot cards, you shuffle the deck of cards, right? So there's a random aspect. Um, only, of course, we believe there's no such thing as random, really. Yeah. There's no such thing as coincidence. Actually, everything goes according to some law, just that we don't know what that law is. <laughs> so, you know, scientists would, would give up and say, oh, and just do a statistical study, you know? <laughs> but we say, no, this is the universe speaking to us through this communications channel. Uh, we, uh, we ask the question and we open up and we listen, and then we have to interpret also. See, there's another step to it. You know, the, the tea leaves in the temple <laughs> form some pattern that we have to interpret it. It requires some effort on our part. So our vision or our intelligence is also engaged. The tool of astrology, for example, in the hands of, of an idiot <laughs> won't give you any <laughs> useful information, but in the hands of a real expert, like, like my astrologer in India, he's a 12th generation uh, in his family. And, you know, he's the only one who wow. ever read my chart and, and got it right. You know, and now every time I ask, you know, he's so funny. Every time I ask him, well, what about this? And what about that? He says, well, you know, you're realized, you know, <laughs> get with it. <laughs> you don't need me. <laughs> he's funny. He really encouraged me because he was, he looked at my chart and he said, oh, oh, you're enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which nobody else ever did. Everybody else tried to interpret the chart according to their level of consciousness, which in most cases yeah. was inappropriate. But he got it right yeah, away. Yeah, like I like how you um when you approached Joy Dish when um Noli was called um Vedanta Vedanta Mukti, um you Put in you had instructed people that it's better for you to do your own chart than anybody else and yeah. that, like a lot of commercial people don't like um promote that they oh i can tell you about your future i can tell you about your past i can tell you about this that and the third and like the connection between the person who's casting the chart and the person who's getting their chart done is like really integral and in, like actually getting some type of valid information you, you cannot see beyond your own level of evolution. You know, if you were to go, if you were like a high school student <clears throat> and you, you got an uh, opportunity to sit down and talk with Einstein, you know, what would you talk about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're not going to talk about unified field theory. That's probably <laughs> for sure. I, I'd ask Except him. I I'd ask him if. <laughs> I'd ask him if he coded the Vedas in relativity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Einstein was very cool because in relativity he brought in the idea of the observer, and how the observer and the motion of the observer influences the whole perception of the event. And by doing that, by saying that the motion of the observer like actually makes the universe change 
you know. Um, he really said that the universe kind of adapts itself or constructs itself according to the observer, according to the consciousness. And he brought in consciousness by the back door, which I thought was really cool. He doesn't even call it consciousness. He just calls it the observer, you know, it's kind of impersonally. Yeah. But, you know, we know what he meant. <laughs> exactly. He meant awareness. Exactly. Yes. Because the speed um, of light in the universe is a constant, 186,000 miles per second. So if you have two objects, let's say, traveling toward each other, and each one is going 100,000 miles per second, that's 200,000, right? Mm -hmm. We can't have that. Uh -uh. The whole universe is going to configure itself so that each of them sees the other one traveling at 186,000. So it's like set at a certain meter, basically. Yes. And it will adjust. It will go through all kinds of convolutions to maintain that oh. standard. The di actual dimensionality of the universe will shift. And, you know, he didn't get that far to describe like how that happens, but he said that it happens and observations have since proven it true. Mm. I don't th there's no major tenet. He didn't get gravity quite right, but everything else has been completely proved by observations. So good old Einstein, one of my heroes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, stick it to stick it to the scientists, and they and they you know um, use his formulas a lot. And yeah, kind of snuck in awareness. I really like that. Um, another thing that uh, I wanted to ask was the I think that the title for the last video, "Friends and Knowledge," um, that there's a lot there. Um, the relationship between let's just say a guru and a disciple it's 2022 now and this uh process has been going on for thousands of years but it's kind of morphed in form a little bit would you say that friends and knowledge is a good way to show that relationship i think so because it leads to a flat hierarchy less just invented a new word uh, relationship. <laughs> in other words, there's no like imbalance between the, the guru and the disciple. The guru is somebody who simply got it first. That's all. But there's no like, there doesn't have to be any like social altitude or authority or any of that. If the disciple is wise, when he encounters someone who knows something he doesn't know, or has realized something he hasn't realized, uh, he will approach that person and inquire. That's been my guiding light this whole lifetime. If I found somebody who knew something that I didn't know, I'm like, well, what's this and what's that? And how did you do that? And what, is, what does this mean? And what does that mean? I'm all over them, you know? <laughs> And uh, this served me very well because it led me to encounter some very interesting people who gave me uh, more than just knowledge, who gave me blessings, their good intentions. And this allowed me to progress much further and faster than I would have if I had just tried to go on my own. So that relationship is great. And, uh, you know, the Buddha called it the friend. Yeah. That's why we, we made that series back in the days, um, Call of the Friend. And um, it means a friend is someone who reflects the wisdom within you. The Brahman is within you. The Brahman is you. 
And to the degree that you realize Brahman, you can also speak with the voice of Brahman, like Krishna is doing in Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. So someone who still has various blocks and structures and stuff in the way can hear that and use it to find that same voice in themselves and make a lot of spiritual advancement. You know, like even like when I was still, my first guru, actual real life face-to-face -face guru was Ali Akbar Khan, the musician. And I was studying music, Indian music with him, Vedic music. And he would say things like, the heart of this raga is God's compassion and joy. Mm. You know? And then he would proceed to play for half an hour. Some beautiful <laughs> <That's> raga. <cool. laughs> I mean, yeah, right. That's guru. See? And then he helped... So he helps you hear that same music in yourself. He always used to say, don't worry about the notes. The notes are just mechanical. Play what's in your heart. Play the feeling. And you got it. You'll get it right automatically. Music is a language. A language that describes feelings. Right? So... Uh, especially in the Indian music, there are uh, associations of all the ragas with certain uh, characters in Vedic uh, mythology <laughs> or scriptures and uh, certain stories and certain emotions. And so the great Indian artists, when they would play ragas, would invoke these emotions and there was, you know, even one, one musician named Tan Sen could make it rain. <laughs> With the vibrations. Yes. Yeah. He did this numerous times, you know. In, in Talk the about rock and roll. <laughs> you know, we've come a long way, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From those days. <laughs> A yeah. long way down. It's amazing. Like rap music and hip hop is, is I mean, you know, come on. Compared I was going to say, we see that in the cinema today, like how they use theatrical music to, um, to you know, gauge the mood and advertisements. We had a conversation previously on how advertisements, they try to catch a certain mood and um, yes. make you feel a certain way. Yeah. That was my first job right out of college, writing that kind of music. It basically tells you how you should feel. Mm. Yeah. You know, like the, you know, like the, the actress is opening the door to the basement, right? <laughs> yeah. In the horror movie, right? And there's this weird music in the background, <laughs> you know, telling you, oh, you should be afraid. You should be afraid. Don't go down there. Oh, no. You know, yeah. it anticipates and creates the mood for what's about to occur, which, which is visually st still not there yet. Huh? But there's a vibe. And, and, you know, these things happen in life, too. If you watch your life, you'll notice that before something happens, you'll get a vibe. Mm -hmm. You'll get a feeling about it, you know? Oh, I have a bad feeling about this. <laughs> Han Solo <laughs> sees the death scar. <laughs> yeah, I would, too. It's true, though. <laughs> yeah, but it's true. Do. Yeah, and, and this is because everything that happens in our life is due to our karma, which is expressed by the, the birth astrology. Um, and, you know, deep down somewhere we know, we know what's going to happen. 
and we can anticipate it and people who are close to us who are sensitive can anticipate it and read it and this is life this is why the the guru is important too because a lot a lot of times the guru can perceive things you can't is sensitive more sensitive is is it um well we oh, this was put inside of the matrix learning i believe the foundation series um but i think it could be touched on again that like guru is in the same as going to uh take residency let's just say when you're becoming a doctor like you always have to kind of go to somebody who has already achieved some type of knowledge like actualized knowledge nyana and go to them study under them and then be able to realize it on your own it, so it's almost more like a tool for your realizations whatever they may be but the well, it's, a, it's, it's a it's a very high bandwidth channel to be with yeah. somebody who's realized you know uh, reading a book one word or one line at a time is nothing compared with the amount of information you get by being in the presence of someone who is realized isn't it you know just like these video conversations are are so much richer than simply chatting in text yeah it's a higher bandwidth connection has more nuance more information so yeah. this is highly recommended in all traditions and all scriptures it's a kind of like apprenticeship you want to be a holy man you want to be enlightened Okay, approach someone who has already got it. They'll show you the path. Or at least they'll put you on your path and give you a push. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it, it, it just really falls on, on authentication or just finding a person who's actually authentic, who's not trying to sell something. Yeah. Um, and I, I think in some of the, the ancient scriptures, they even give you a way to determine um, how to identify that person. Yeah, he shouldn't be exploiting you. He shouldn't be using you. He should be giving you something, not taking something. Yeah. That's very important because today there's so many counterfeits. And, you know, they want money, they want this, they want followers, they want that, obedience, you know, and so on. That's why I think it's very useful from the very beginning to say no hierarchy. Yeah. I'm not any different or better than anybody else. I just happen to have gotten there, you know, somehow or other. And if I can do it, you can do it. And you should do it because it's going to bring you immense happiness. You can tell, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy. Even though I'm 75 years old, my body is falling apart. Hey, I don't... <laughs> so oh, we're, man. we're almost out of time. Basically are out of time. All right. So we can continue this later. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Namaste. Aum Tat Sat. Namaste Bhagavan. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. Namah Shivaya. <laughs> <laughs>